Welcome back to Pastor Emily's Story Hour. We're reading The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This is part 17. We're still in Marion Halcombe's narrative. November 10th. Finding that she was composed and like herself this morning, I returned to the painful subject of yesterday for the sole purpose of imploring her to let me speak to Sir Percival and Mr. Fairley more plainly and strongly than she could speak to either of them herself about this lamentable marriage. She interposed gently but firmly in the middle of my remonstrances. I left yesterday to decide, she said, and yesterday has decided. It is too late to go back. Sir Percival spoke to me this afternoon about what had passed in Laura's room. He assured me that the unparalleled trust she had placed in him had awakened such an answering conviction of her innocence and an integrity in his mind that he was guiltless of having felt even a moment's unworthy jealousy, either at the time when he was in her presence or afterwards when he had withdrawn from it. Deeply as he lamented the unfortunate attachment which had hindered the progress he might otherwise have made in her esteem and regard, he firmly believed that it had remained un unacknowledged in the past, and that it would remain, under all changes of circumstances which it was possible to contemplate, unacknowledged in the future. This was his absolute conviction, and the strongest proof he could give of it was the assurance, which he now offered, that he felt no curiosity to know whether the attachment was of recent date or not, or who the object had been. His implicit confidence in Miss Fairley made him satisfied with what she had thought fit to say to him, and he was honestly innocent of the slightest feeling of anxiety to hear more. He waited after saying those words and looked at me. I was so conscious of my unreasonable prejudice against him, so conscious of an unworthy suspicion that he might be speculating on my impulsivity answering the very questions which he had just described himself as resolved not to ask, that I evaded all reference to this part of the subject with something like a feeling of confusion on my own part. At the same time, I was resolved not to lose even the smallest opportunity of trying to plead Laura's cause, and I told him boldly that I regretted his generosity had not carried him one step further and induced him to withdraw from the engagement altogether. Here again, he disarmed me by not attempting to defend himself, he would merely beg me to remember the difference there was between his allowing Miss Fairley to give him up, which was a matter of submission only, and his forcing himself to give up Miss Fairley, which was, in other words, asking him to be the suicide of his own hopes. Her conduct of the day before had so strengthened the unchangeable love and admiration of two long years that all active contention against those feelings on his part was henceforth entirely out of his power. I must think him weak, selfish, unfeeling towards the very woman whom he idolized, and he must bow to my opinion as resignedly as he could, only putting it to me at the same time whether her future as a single woman, pining under an unhappily placed attachment which she could never acknowledge, could be said to promise her a much brighter prospect than her future as the wife of a man who worshipped the very ground she walked on. In the last case, there was hope from time, however slight it might be. In the first case, on her own showing, there was no hope at all. I answered him, more because my tongue is a woman's and must answer than because I had anything convincing to say. It was only too plain that the course Laura had adopted the day before had offered him the advantage if he chose to take it, and that he had chosen to take it. I felt this at the time, and I feel it just as strongly now while I write these lines in my own room. The one hope left is that his motives really spring, as he says they do, from the irresistible strength of his attachment to Laura. Before I close my diary for tonight, I must record that I wrote today, in poor Hartwright's interest, to two of my mother's old friends in London, both men of influence and position. If they can do anything for him, I am quite sure they will. Except Laura, I never was more anxious about anyone than I am now about Walter. All that has happened since he left us has only increased my strong regard and sympathy for him. I hope I am doing right in trying to help him to employment abroad. I hope, most earnestly and anxiously, that it will end well. The Eleventh Sir Percival had an interview with Mr. Fairley, and I was sent for to join them. 
I found Mr. Fairley greatly relieved at the prospect of the family worry, as he was pleased to describe his niece's marriage, being settled at last. So far I did not feel called on to say anything to him about my own opinion, but when he proceeded in his most aggravatingly languid manner to suggest that the time for the marriage had better be settled next in accordance with Sir Percival's wishes, I enjoyed the satisfaction of assailing Mr. Fairley's nerves with as strong a protest against hurrying Laura's decision as I could put into words. Sir Percival immediately assured me that he felt the force of my objection, and begged me to believe that the proposal had not been made in consequence of any interference on his part. Mr. Fairley leaned back in his chair, closed his eyes, and said we both of us did honor to human nature, and then repeated his suggestion as coolly as if neither Sir Percival nor I had said a word in opposition to it. It ended in my flatly declining to mention the subject to Laura, unless she first approached it of her own accord. I left the room at once after making that declaration. Sir Percival looked seriously embarrassed and distressed. Mr. Fairley stretched out his lazy legs on his velvet footstool and said, Dear Marion, how I envy you your robust nervous system. Don't bang the door! On going to Laura's room, I found that she had asked for me, and that Mrs. Vesey had informed her that I was with Mr. Fairley. She inquired at once what I had been wanted for, and I told her all that had passed without attempting to conceal the vexation and annoyance that I really felt. Her answer surprised and distressed me inexpressibly. It was the very last reply that I should have expected her to make. "'My uncle is right,' she said. "'I have caused trouble and anxiety enough to you and to all about me. Let me cause no more, Marian. Let Sir Percival decide.' I remonstrated warmly, but nothing I could say moved her. "'I am held to my engagement,' she replied. "'I have broken with my old life. The evil day will not come the less surely because I put it off. No, Marian, once again my uncle is right. I have caused enough trouble and anxiety, and I will cause no more.' She used to be pliability itself, but she was now inflexibly passive in her resignation. I might almost say in her despair. Dearly as I love her, I should have been less pained if she had been violently agitated. It was so shockingly unlike her natural character to see her as cold and insensible as I saw her now. The Twelfth Sir Percival put some questions to me at breakfast about Laura, which left me no choice but to tell him what she had said. While we were talking, she herself came down and joined us. She was just as unnaturally composed in Sir Percival's presence as she had been in mine. When breakfast was over, he had an opportunity of saying a few words to her privately in a recess in one of the windows. They were not more than two or three minutes together, and on their separating she left the room with Mrs. Vesey while Sir Percival came to me. He said he had entreated her to favor him by maintaining her privilege of fixing the time of the marriage at her own will and pleasure. In reply, she had merely expressed her acknowledgments and had desired him to mention what his wishes were to Miss Halcombe. I have no patience to write more. In this instance, as in every other, Sir Percival has carried his point with the utmost possible credit to himself in spite of everything that I can say or do. His wishes are now what they were, of course, when he first came here, and Laura, having resigned herself to the one inevitable sacrifice of the marriage, remains as coldly hopeless and enduring as ever. In parting with the little occupations and relics that reminded her of Hartwright, she seems to have parted with all her tenderness and all her impressibility. It is only three o'clock in the afternoon while I write these lines, and Sir Percival has left us already in the happy hurry of a bridegroom to prepare for the bride's reception at his house in Hampshire. Unless some extraordinary event happens to prevent it, they will be married exactly at the time when he wishes to be married, before the end of the year. My very fingers burn as I write it. The Thirteenth. A sleepless night through uneasiness about Laura. Towards the morning I came to a resolution to try what change of scene would do to rouse her. She cannot surely remain in her present torpor of insensibility if I take her away from Limeridge and surround her with the pleasant faces of old friends. After some consideration I have decided on writing to the Arnolds in Yorkshire. They are simple, kind-hearted, hospitable people. 
and she has known them from her childhood. When I put the letter in the post bag, I told her what I had done. It would have been a relief to me if she had shown the spirit to resist and object, but no, she only said, I will go anywhere with you, Marion. I dare say you are right. I dare say the change will do me good. Fourteenth. I wrote to Mr. Gilmore, informing him that there was really a prospect of this miserable marriage taking place, and also mentioning my idea of trying what a change of scene would do for Laura. I had no heart to go into particulars. Time enough for them when we get nearer to the end of the year. Fifteenth. Three letters for me. The first from the Arnolds, full of delight at the prospect of seeing Laura and me. The second from one of the gentlemen to whom I wrote on Walter Hartwright's behalf, informing me that he has been fortunate enough to find an opportunity of complying with my request. The third, from Walter himself, thanking me, poor fellow, in the warmest terms for giving him an opportunity of leaving his home, his country, and his friends. A private expedition to make excavations among the ruined cities of Central America is, it seems, about to sail for Liverpool. The draftsman who had been already appointed to accompany it has lost heart and withdrawn at the eleventh hour, and Walter is to fill his place. He is to be engaged for six months certain from the time of landing in Honduras, and for a year afterwards if the excavations are successful and if the funds hold out. His letter ends with a promise to write me a farewell line when they are all on board ship and when the pilot leaves them. I can only hope and pray earnestly that he and I are both acting in this matter for the best. It seems such a serious step for him to take that the mere contemplation of it startles me, and yet... In his unhappy position, how can I expect him or wish him to remain at home? Sixteenth. The carriage is at the door. Laura and I set out on our visit to the Arnolds today. Polesdean Lodge, Yorkshire, the 23rd. A week in these new scenes and among these kind-hearted people has done her some good, though not so much as I had hoped. I have resolved to prolong our stay for another week at least. It is useless to go back to Limeridge until there is an absolute necessity for our return. The 24th. Sad news by this morning's post. The expedition to Central America sailed on the 21st. We have parted with a true man. We have lost a faithful friend. Walter Hartwright has left England. The 25th. Sad news yesterday. Ominous news today. Sir Percival Glyde has written to Mr. Fairley, and Mr. Fairley has written to Laura and me to recall us to Limeridge immediately. What can this mean? Has the day for the marriage been fixed in our absence? Come back tomorrow for the next installment.